Hello there. Uh, my name is uh, Salve Nielsen. I'm uh, uh, one of the conference organizers and uh, perhaps the person you could say that started this version of the Open Source Developers Conference, the Nordic one. Um, so we, we started out with uh, huge ambitions, uh, wanted to make something very fostem like inviting uh, all kinds of communities, and, uh, but it turned out to be smaller than we hoped for, but I think that just means we'll uh, have a better time getting to know each other and uh, just uh, hanging out and talking and uh, uh, get, having fun and learning stuff. So I hope you guys are ready for that. Um, uh, and try to make an extra effort, by the way. Just speak with somebody you have never spoken with and say what you're doing or hey, what are you doing? And uh, uh, we'll have a great time. So, uh, but if you, for some reason, uh, feel uh, that it's necessary to not be social, uh, there we have a wireless network here. Uh, <laughs> so you can get on Facebook or whatever. Uh, uh, we have several actually, uh, but the, please use the one called U UIO Guest. Uh, at, at, hmm? Okay, uh, try it. If it, it uh, you are August, you can register with your phone number and get a 12-hour pass there. If that doesn't work, we have a backup, and that's the conferences. Uh, I guess the network, but uh, I'll just listen for you guys a while, uh, and if you guys are complaining constantly, we'll uh, release the password for the conferences network. Yeah. <laughs> We've been uh, uh, urged by the local IT group to test the UIS, UOIO <laughs> guest there, so, so, so we'll, we'll try that for a while. Uh, other than that, um, before we uh, start with uh, Simon's uh, pr presentation, um, this conference has a code of conduct. It means uh, basically be nice to each other. Uh, the, the, those of us who have t-shirts like this, uh, if, if, if contact us if somebody isn't being nice. But I really don't want to make a mess or, or make a point out of this, but uh, we have the rules there, read them, just make yourself familiar with them, and in general it's just be nice. That's the nice thing to each other and everyone else. Um, other than that, uh, f a final note perhaps worth mentioning, after the conference is done today, uh, you guys are invited to Hackeriet. There will be more messages around lunchtime around that, I'm thinking. So. Uh, if you guys are planning something for the evening or, or not planning for the evening, consider visiting uh, one of the local hacker spaces here for some club and uh, hanging out. Um, and now I'll be leaving. Well, yes? Oh, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, our pro program uh, boss here says uh, we have lightning talks. Uh, uh, submit your lightning talks. Five minutes, uh, any topic you like. Uh, if it's funny, it's awesome. If it's cool, it's awesome. Uh, it's, it's a great, great way to try out giving a talk if you're not used to it yourself. And the whole point with the lightning talks is just to get some interesting points across or cool things that you've experienced. Anybody can do it uh, and talk with Carl Rune. Can you stand up, Carl? That guy, he'll be hanging out there. Make sure, make sure to uh, get in touch with him if you want to try yourself out with a try out giving a lightning talk. And that's my message. Simon, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. 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 Good. Uh, so I'm Simon Phipps. Um, I told Salve that I would give a, re a reverse bio. So at the moment, I work for an Indian system integrator called Wipro, who told me that they're uh, future of business is all going to be based on open source. And so I believed that that was an opportunity for me to steer some enormous corporations into using open source. Um, Wipro runs the data centers for companies like Apple. Uh, so it, it, you, you, of course, never use the iTunes Music Store. But your relatives who do are uh, all using Wipro's services every time they do that. 
Uh, before that, I worked uh, as an independent consultant, helping people with open source issues, governance, licensing, community. Before that, I helped uh, ForgeRock uh, liberate their identity middleware product from Oracle. Before that, I didn't join Oracle. I left Sun Microsystems on the very last day that I could, and uh, Oracle, for some reason, didn't make a job offer to me. I don't quite know why. It seems they didn't need a, uh, an uh, unwavering open source advocate in their executive staff, but oh well. Uh, before that, I worked for Sun Microsystems for 10 years, uh, and while I was there, I released all of Sun's uh, software platform as open source, including Java, Unix, the tool platforms, um, uh, I, I didn't actually release uh, Star Office and then Open Office, but I was the product manager for a while. Uh, I helped get ODF into uh, being an open standard and did lots of work in the European Parliament. Before that, I worked for IBM for 10 years. Uh, I started IBM's Java business along with four other people in 1995. And I started IBM's XML activities in 1997 with some other people. Uh, before that, I worked on video conferencing and video conferencing standards for IBM in a product that you've never heard of because it was canned just before it got successful. Uh, before that, I worked for uh, a, a company called Unisys. Uh, and uh, they, I had actually joined them when they were called Burroughs. I worked on um, their mainframe range. I actually live in Southampton, which is a shipping, uh, shipping town. And uh, Burroughs was used for uh, providing all of the infrastructure for their container lines. So I learned how to boot a very large mainframe by putting the boot code in on the front panel switches and pressing the load button. And I was one of the monkeys that went in in the morning to go and put that in and load the bootstrap so that it would read the mag tape, so that it would then read the disk, so that it would then start. Uh, so before that, I was uh, at school where I was lucky enough to have a science teacher who was moonlighting building uh, microprocessor development systems for a Silicon Valley startup called Southwest Technical Products. And that was where I learned to write assembly code, which is, of course, the only true programming code. Uh, everything else is simply a convenience. So that's my career. Um, I thought I'd retired before I went to Wipro. Uh, over the last uh, eight or nine years, I've been with the Open Source Initiative and I've been helping convert the Open Source Initiative into a uh, member organization promoting open source uh, now that it has come to dominance. So this was the presentation I was going to give you. Uh, it's quite a good presentation. I, I quite like many aspects of it. But then I began to realize that probably in an audience this size, we could afford to take some risks. We could afford to talk about ideas rather than just put boring slides up on the screen. So I went and bought a, a, an exercise book, and uh, I've, 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 I've written a book. It's all in here. And I thought that we, we could discuss what's in here. Now, if that doesn't work out, I've got some great photographs I can show you. Um, and you know, we can look at my, my animal photographs from around the world. I've got some great pictures of a bear in California that I can show you, and I've got some, some dolphins and some turtles. So we can do that if it all goes pear-shaped, as we say in England. But uh, if it works out, let's talk about some ideas. Now, let the, the, the idea that I want to talk to you about is, and let's, I think there might even be some slides here somewhere. Oh, I, I've got some disclaimers to give you. That's my career. Uh, I, so disclaimer for you. I tell stories, all right? I, I, I mean, I'm... I'm uh, last night... Uh, were you all here last night? I think you all were, weren't you? So uh, last night, I'm sitting on two couches with two... Um, I apologize to Krista, two extremely smart guys. I don't know if you've read Mark's Wikipedia page, but M Mark has, has, has been a, a, one of the uh, leading thinkers in computer science. And it's, it's there on his Wikipedia page. It's scary sitting next to him and worrying that he might want to have a conversation with you. And uh, I, I'm not like that. I, I'm, I'm not a great intellect. I, I listen to other people and I tell stories about what I heard. And consequently, nothing that I say should be construed as legal or political advice. And, um, and you should take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Trust, but verify, as the, uh, my favorite statue in Washington, D.C. says. So um, uh, open source is now everywhere. Uh, it's now official that open source 
is running 78% of businesses. Uh, if you look at that survey that number comes from, there are some much more significant numbers in it. It turns out that 65% of the companies who responded to that survey um, are contributing to open source communities. And that's a massive increase just in a year. That's a massive increase. It was only 50% in the same survey last year. And the, the really big story about the adoption of open source is less that uh, open source is being used by lots of people. It's more that people are actually collaborating around open source. And uh, because of that, I think the challenges that we face as an open source community are going to change. Uh, I think the challenges that we face are going to be the challenges of scale, the challenges of human organization, the challenges of politics. Now, uh, it turns out that the guys who started the open source movement, and this is them, um, you, you, uh, you, you'll recognize this guy over, over on this side, but um, this is Bill Joy. And the thing that's not remembered about the free and open source software movement is these two guys are actually operating at roughly the same time. One on the uh, US West Coast and one on the US East Coast. And they had very different approaches to free and open source software. Uh, for various reasons, uh, Mr. Stallman's, or Dr. Stallman's view, was very much focused on the personal liberties of programmers and of software users. Whereas uh, uh, Dr. Joy's uh, approach was very much based on wanting to get cool code written and have people stay out of his way. And that very much colored the software bases that they created. So uh, Bill Joy was uh, instrumental in the existence of the BSD license. And the BSD license can pretty much be summed up as, take my cool code, do what you please with it, don't pretend it's your own, and don't bother me. That's what that license says in human readable text. And the license that Richard Stallman wrote basically says, take my cool code, do whatever you like with it, but don't you ever prevent any other person from having access to it. You just make sure that you extend to everyone else the same freedom that you had in getting the code from me. That's what his license says. Apart from that, they're operating at the same time. They've both had a massive impact on the computer industry. Uh, well before Linux was even a twinkle in Linus Torvalds' eye, Bill Joy's software was already powering many of the world's corporations. Uh, and that's BSD Unix, was already there. Not, you might not have realized it, but it was there in Windows. And it was there inside Solaris. And it was there inside many other Unix uh, platforms. And it took a change in society to make the vision that Richard Stallman had become a reality. Because Bill's vision was focused just on the code, whereas Richard's vision was based on the language you use to talk about things and the ethics behind that language. So now I'm going to suggest to you that we need to rethink the language that we use to talk about open source software if open source software is going to be the default, and if every company is going to participate in and contribute to open source communities. Because if we keep on talking about it the way we talk about it at the moment, we're going to end up in trouble. Uh, now, the reason for that is because we typically don't talk about it the way Richard talks about it. See, when, and Richard doesn't even talk about it this way. So this is my summary of Richard's Four Freedoms, uh, and I structure it slightly differently. I say that open source software is, freedom, is software that comes with the four freedoms, the freedom to use for any purpose, the freedom to study the software, the, study to imp the freedom to improve the software so it better meets your needs and the needs of others, and the freedom to share the original and the modified versions of the software with whomsoever you please. Those are the four freedoms. Richard structures it a bit differently, but all the same freedoms are in there somewhere, just with different numbers. Now, um, this remains the core ideal of open source software. Uh, open source has always been about this. Um, uh, th there's a temptation to believe that free software and open source are different things somehow. But please don't think that. Open source software and free software are the same thing. Uh, free software is software that comes with these four freedoms. Open source software is software that is licensed under a copyright license that guarantees these four freedoms. 
They are the same thing. And uh, any distinction that anyone tries to pile on free software and open source is somebody who has another agenda to do with their politics or their ideology. So they're the, they're the same thing. Now, it turns out that, uh, that corporations are the real problem. Um, this, by the way, uh, I took this photograph in India. This is on the Raj path, and this demonstrates that even sacred cows can be useful. But it's in here for the lawnmower. Uh, Brian Cantrill, who I used to work with at Sun, tried to explain something about corporations. We often think that corporations uh, are evil. Um, it's very tempting to believe that Microsoft is evil or that Google is evil. Uh, and I'd like to explain to you that corporations are not evil. Corporations don't love you, they don't hate you, uh, they're not out to get you. A corporation is just a machine. It is just a set of rules being executed by sufficiently large numbers of employees that they are unable to apply their own ethical views on the outcomes. And consequently, a corporation doesn't love you or hate you. It's just like a lawnmower. If you put your hand in a lawnmower, your hand gets cut off. And it didn't get cut off because the lawnmower hates you. It got cut off because it's a lawnmower. And that's what lawnmowers do. They cut things. So any time a corporation gets involved in anything, you have to understand that it's just a machine. It doesn't love you or hate you. It doesn't inherently have a good character or a bad character. It's just a machine. The only way you can vary that in any way is if the people in the corporation are empowered. And if the people in the corporation are empowered in a way that lets them override the undesirable outcomes. Okay, so now, so this was the presentation that I was gonna give you, you see. So this is, it's kind of fun, quite like it. Um, if we're going to think about what the meaning of open source is, I ought to put something up there that isn't these slides, I suppose. Let me see. Uh, there we go. Put that up there. Okay. Uh, so if, if we're going to, do, going to talk about open source software, we have to understand what we're doing when we talk about open source software. So when we talk about open source software, we are typically using the word free. Uh, now, I understand that the word free is not the same problem in Norwegian as it is in English. But the word free is a big problem in English. If you speak English as a first language, whenever you hear the word free, you will assume it is about money. It does have an extremely useful and historic uh, other meaning, which is about liberty. But it will always be about money the first time you hear it. And uh, a, a, a scholar called George Lakoff has written all about what happens when you use words that summon an idea. He talks about it as frames. He discusses linguistic frames. Now, a linguistic frame is a set of words that you use to metaphorically describe something which is difficult to understand as a human being. You use a frame when you are talking about uh, your political struggle. You use a frame when you talk about uh, uh, being, uh, feeling oppressed in your job. Uh, you use, these are all metaphorical words. It's unlikely that you're actually struggling in your politics because the word struggle itself is quite a difficult word to define, but is definitely very physical. And you're probably not doing any physical struggling. But when you use a word like that, you then set uh, the palette of the rest of the words that can be used to describe the situation that you're in. So let me give you an example of this, uh, and it's not a very nice example, uh, and it's nothing to do with technology. So uh, if you have somebody in your family who is very sick, maybe they have a terminal disease, it is tempting to talk about them as fighting with their disease you'll say that, 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 that my father is fighting with cancer. And um, what you're doing when you say that is you're invoking a frame. You're invoking what is called the conflict frame to describe the way that your father is dealing with his illness. And you'll often talk about uh, the, the bouts with chemotherapy as battles. And you'll say he's winning this battle or, or the, the cancer is, getting the, is, is, is beating him. 
And the saddest thing about this linguistic frame is when your relative finally dies, which of course is the ultimate statistic, one out of every one people dies, that linguistic frame leads you to say that he lost his battle with cancer. Now, he didn't lose his battle with cancer. He died. There wasn't any, any failure involved. He wasn't defeated. You might have been better off using a different frame to discuss the illness. You might have been better off talking about uh, his change of life because of his, his illness with cancer. You might have been better off talking about how he's spent more time in reflection. Talking about, you might have wanted to talk about how uh, he, he feels unwell and has to spend more time thinking. You might have wanted to use what I might call a reflection frame to discuss that illness. And you'll discover if you use that reflection frame that the things that arise out of the illness are much more positive. You find the products of his reflection. You find the letters that he wrote beginning to become important to you. You find the interactions with family being significant. You find the interactions with family becoming the dominant thought rather than being overshadowed by the fight with the, the illness. So now these are two different frames, two different linguistic palettes. As soon as you say that someone is fighting with an illness, you have invoked a conflict frame and you'll find that every a metaphor you have to use to describe what's happening to them will have to be drawn from that palette. And if it's not, you'll have to qualify it to explain why you're using that metaphor and not one of the metaphors that are expected from the palette. Now, this, this mechanism of using palettes of words applies throughout cognition. It's the way we think. We use palettes of metaphors that are connected to understand the world. And this is why the word free is so unfortunate for open source software. You see, open source software is not fundamentally about price. Open source software is what happens when a group of people who have got a whole diverse range of motivations choose to gather around a software commons and use the contents of that software commons to achieve their own motivational goals. In the process of achieving those own motivational goals, they will collaborate with other people in the community. Most notably, as they improve the software to meet their own motivational goal, they will uh, contribute the work that they did into the commons. They do that not because they're good people, although they probably are. They do that because it would be stupid to do anything else. Because at the instant that you modify code in a code commons and keep your improvements to yourself, you have forked the code. And from that point onwards, you are solely responsible for maintaining that fork of the code. In particular, you're solely responsible for integrating in regressions that arise from improvements that other people make. So, uh, so as soon as you keep a major change to yourself, you fork the code, and almost all of the benefits you had from it being open source software have just gone out of the window, and you are back to proprietary software again. So people contribute to open source communities because it would be stupid to do anything else. And people are in open source communities because they're meeting their own needs. Uh, I, now, the, the important thing about open source is I don't care what their needs are. Uh, we had a question last night about whether I was at all upset that the NSA uses open source software. Uh, well, you know, I'm not too worried about that. I'm much more worried about the NSA than I am about the software that they use. And in the end, I'm quite happy that the NSA uses open source software because there's a certain inevitability to them improving the software for everybody else. And uh, consequently, I think that them participating is probably going to make things better for everyone than if they forked the code and did their own thing in a private room or if they used proprietary code or, heaven forbid, that they wrote their own code from scratch. I'm sure they do all of those things as well, by the way. Uh, they're very big spenders in the IT industry and they invest in a lot of IT startup companies. So open source is fundamentally about people for their own selfish reasons 
taking some code and collaborating with others and contributing back for their own selfish reasons. It is, it is not fundamentally about getting free stuff. It is not fundamentally about avoiding the payment of license fees. It is not fundamentally about it being cheaper. It's actually not fundamentally about it being more secure or better code or any of those things. Those are all orthogonal concepts to open source. Open source software is software that people collaborate around. Now, it turns out that open source software does end up saving you money. Because in order to participate in an open source software, there can't be any barriers to participation. It can't cost you money to get in. It can't, you, they, they, it can't cost you money to use the software because that would prevent people from collaborating. There can't be special license agreements that give people special permissions to use certain things because, well, that gets in the way of the commons and gets in the way of collaborating. So it turns out that open source software actually is um, something which can save you money right up front on license fees and on usage costs. It's also something that can save you money throughout its life cycle. Because the software is always free for you to use, you will never have to budget for license fees. You will, however, have to budget for support and service and programming. None of those things come free of charge. Uh, you may think they're free of charge, but let me uh, assure you that the people that you employ or your own time that you spend on doing the maintenance and the programming actually has a value. You are spending on that software all the time you're using it, even if you're not actually giving money to somebody else. So it turns out that open source software is cheaper to use, but that's not the point. It also turns out that open source software is probably more secure in most cases. Because, well, when you have a real live community that is working on software and using it for their own purposes, actually hands-on and development-wise, they will probably spot defects because there are more eyes looking at the code than would be looking at the code if they were on a development team inside a corporation. There's no guarantee. There's no promise it's more secure. But probably, in a real live active community, it will end up having fewer exploitable defects over the life cycle of the software. And this is the problem, you see. Because it does save you money, because it is slightly more secure as a consequence of these functions, people stick with the price frame. You can't escape the price frame once you've invoked it. Once you've called it free, every IT manager on the planet is thinking about their budget. Now, that doesn't happen when a big corporation goes in to sell them software. When Oracle goes in to sell them software, I can assure you Oracle is not talking about the price. Uh, because that would be really scary if you understood what Oracle was going to cost you over the life cycle of your software. Uh, I compare uh, Oracle to, oh, I bet actually the camera's on, I better not say that. <laughs> you don't have to talk about price when you're talking about software. So let's talk about some other ways of talking about software. The first frame I'd like to suggest to you is what I call the flexibility frame. Flexibility frame. Now, the flexibility frame is a frame where we talk about, um, we talk about innovation, and we talk about uh, the avoiding lock-in, and we talk about um, being able to make changes, and we talk about being able to hire skills, and we talk about uh, being able to respond to new business needs. Open source software fits beautifully within a flexibility frame. So when I'm with a business, I talk about flexibility. I, I say the reason you need open source in your business is for the flexibility it's going to bring you. When you use open source software, you can respond to your changing business environment in a very agile way because there are always new resources for you to use. You'll find that uh, you can uh, obtain innovation for your product very easily in an open source environment because so many other people who are not like you are working on the software, the changes they make come into what you're doing and you discover unexpected new capabilities, unexpected features because of this organic community of people all there for their own reasons. So the flexibility frame works really well in talking about open source software for businesses. 
And uh, I'd encourage you to use the word, you'll, you'll feel that F for free on your in your mouth. F flexibility. Say flexibility when you were about to say free. It's not free software, it's flexible software, it's open source. Second frame I'd like to suggest to you is the permission frame. When you're working in a research environment, uh, or when you're uh, working in a startup company, it's very important that you don't have to keep on asking people for permission to do the next thing. Uh, if you have been involved in any research projects where part of the lab equipment is human beings, you will know that the ethics reviews are a real deadner. You come up with a great idea for how you like to mess around with somebody's mind, and then you've got to go to a, an ethics review and get permission to do it, and it takes ages, and you've got to justify everything. And you end up with a little piece of paper at the end that lets you do your well-designed experiment. Uh, applying for permission to do anything kills innovation. And you know what? If you use proprietary software, you'll find yourself asking for permission the whole time. That permission comes in the form of a license to use the software. It comes in the form of an enterprise agreement to use other parts of the suite. It comes in the form of a non-disclosure agreement that allows you to discuss future features or changes with the supplier and at the same time prevents you from having the same conversations with other people. Uh, a proprietary environment is all about permission. You're asking for permission the whole time. Now with open source software, the permission is all given in advance. That's what an open source license is. It's permission in advance to use, study, modify, and distribute the software. Um, I don't know if you know this about open source software and open source licenses, but the, the, the freedom to use open source software cannot be revoked. There is no license compliance necessary to use open source software. So if you use proprietary software, you'll be familiar with having to do software asset management, with tracking every last license all the way through the business, trying to work out what, it's, what they're all doing, running out of licenses, getting audited by, uh, uh, well, again, I won't name the companies, but there are some companies out there who are very keen to count how many cores you're using this year because they're pretty sure you're going to have to pay them more money. Uh, so you do software asset management and license management to make sure that you know how much you're going to have to pay them next year extra. Um, all of that goes away with open source software because you have the freedom to use it for any purpose. And that freedom to use it is in the copyright license. Uh, when you're using proprietary software, the right to use the software is an end user right in addition to, uh, to the copyright license. It is, you've, the copyright license remains reserved but you have an end user license that allows you to use the software. But open source software has got an exception or a, a license to the copyright that lets you do anything you want with it without asking for permission, without having to keep track of the licenses. Um, something that I'll tell you that will lead you to be irritated for the rest of your life. Uh, I'd, when you are loading a new piece of software, you'll be familiar with the first time you load it, there's a little screen that pops up with the license inside and you have to click, OK, I agree with the license. That's completely unnecessary with open source software. And anyone who has put that into the installer for their open source software probably doesn't like people very much. Because it's just not necessary. Because the open source license gives you the right to use the software without taking any additional action. And that right to use the software in almost every case can't be withdrawn. Even with the GPL, even when you violate the GPL, your right to use the software remains. Your right to distribute the software gets taken away, but your right to use the software remains even if you have violated the terms of the GPL. So this frame is a, is a great frame if you're dealing with research, if you're dealing with software users, if you're dealing with uh, innovators in enterprises. It's the permission frame. Permission is given in advance. And then the final frame, if you, if you just can't escape going back to talking about uh, software freedom, and I talk about software freedom most of the time. Um, in most conversations, I don't talk about open source or free software. I talk about software freedom. And that comes from what I call the liberty frame. The liberty frame is a frame that actually talks about those four freedoms. It talks about your liberty to use the software for any purpose, your liberties around the software, 
And that is the most useful way of having a conversation with other advocates of open source software. Because you can have a conversation about their liberties, and that doesn't accidentally cause the other people listening in on the conversation to believe that what you're doing is talking about price. So um, I think this is a crucial thing that we have to do as an open source community. And I, I think that we we've fairly soon need to focus our minds on making sure we're talking about the liberty benefits of open source software. Now, the reason I believe that is because these legions of corporations are moving into open source now. And um, they are moving in and they're starting new communities. They're starting communities like OpenStack. And uh, I don't know how many people here participate in OpenStack. And does anyone participate in OpenStack? Got a few people there. Do, are you all aware? Does anyone not know what OpenStack is? Jolly good. Okay, so Open, OpenStack is one of these fascinating organizations uh, where I, I simply don't understand why it happened so fast. I was at the OSCON where OpenStack was announced, and suddenly there were people in all directions who were forming an organization and uh, s standardizing this software. I posit that it exists for the same reason that the uh, web services uh, initiative existed at the start of the 2000s. Uh, you all look rather young, actually. So who here remembers web services and SOAP? Anyone? Lovely. So, uh, so I, 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 something I don't mention in the, in the bio, that I was, I was slightly involved in that as well. Um, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, everyone thought about networks as things that happened between computers rather than as, you know, clouds. And uh, so the thinking about networks was about uh, object-oriented programming and moving objects across networks from this computer to that computer. And so our thinking was very much about marshalling objects and uh, having a very orderly way of letting computers collaborate with each other. And we came up with this thing called CORBA, uh, which is uh, uh, an object request broker and it was a gift to corporate software developers um, in the sense that those corporate software developers were able to make lots of money dealing with the infinite complexity that it created and therefore had a job for life like COBOL programmers have got. Now, when the internet came along, we all quickly worked out that COBOL was not the answer because you simply couldn't make COBOL reliably work over a socket connection across to an arbitrary point on the planet. It just didn't work. And uh, suddenly, a whole lot of corporations who had invested a lot of money in Corba as the answer for enterprise computing started to panic. And so what did they do? Well, they took Corba and they rewrote it for the web. And they called it web services. Uh, and instead of calling it Corba, they called it SOAP. And it, too, was a source of infinite complexity and mind-boggling uh, uh, testing black holes. And uh, you're, maybe you're still blighted with soap in your life. I don't know. Uh, I have, uh, does anyone here have Sonos Hi-Fis? Have you got Sonos? Sonos music players? You know that those Sonos music players all work with soap, do you? Yeah, so, so there is a, there's an object request broker that's passing the messages between the players. And that's why there is still no web player for, the, for Sonos, is because it is a thing of infinite complexity to write deterministically. Um, so WSI existed as a kind of a stalling tactic. It was, oh my God, the internet's come along, our Corba strategy is dead, quick, write it for the web. And uh, then REST came along, and JSON, and we realized that we really didn't need all of that complexity. And SOAP became something that we were kind of left, left with. Now there's a few heads shaking here, you see. So this was the seductive force of Corba. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I tend to think that REST um, fits better in with the, design, with the design principle of the internet. It's going with the grain of the wood. I think using, using, object using a complex layered objects goes across the grain of the internet because you, you have to have such a reliable environment to be able to have it work. Or you, you either have to have a reliable environment or you have to simulate a reliable environment. So, th th so this is this. We had that. We I remember having this argument about soap and rest, and 
I was I, no, I was at, I was working. Who was I working for? Uh, I was working. I was at Sun by then. I, I, we'd had a little bit of the conversation at IBM. Is it? Uh, yes. So, so it's, I, I, I remain convinced that SOAP is not the right answer for the internet. But uh, oh, of so now we've. We, we, and by the way, we have reached the point now where uh, I would love to have a conversation with you because we're we're a small, intimate audience, and you can argue back because I told you right up front I'm wrong. Okay, I I, I only reflect back the things that I've heard from other people. And I, I would like your, your ideas and your thoughts on this. So I have a strong bias against, against CORBA because I think that it leads to in infinitely complex programs and I think you should only use it where you absolutely have to. Um, I think that using it on web apps is a big mistake. You will find yourself uh, knee, deep in <laughs> knee deep in missing bits of objects that, you, that, that, that have somehow got lost due to latency. And uh, microphone. I especially see it grow business to business communication or governmental communication and so on. Not not for web. I think Corba is a disaster for. Yeah, for Corba, but it's so, about soap. So so, so, um, so, so soap. Well, soap is just Corba. I mean, let's let's face it. It's, it's you know, it's just it's just just Corba dressed up in sockets. Um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, so I, I remember talking about this back in the late nineties. You, you can use CORBA and SOAP in places where you control both of the endpoints. But if one of the endpoints is outside your control, it's in somebody else's enterprise, you should not use CORBA. Because using CORBA relies on you having strong control over the definition of the object at the, at the, at the other endpoint. Uh, so the, 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 the audience comment there was, uh, if you can bill per hour, it's quite nice. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and again, you know, it's it's like that 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 uh, that Y2K thing of still being able to program in COBOL. Many of us did very nicely out of Y2K as a result of COBOL still being. And it's it's amazing. COBOL is still around. I went and covered a uh, press conference recently. Um, so I don't know if you've been following what happened to SUSE, the Linux distribution, but SUSE got bought by Novell. Novell got bought by Attachmate. Attachmate got bought by Microfocus. And SUSE is now back being a big, strong, independent entity, uh, having had all of those layers of redundancy stripped off. Um, Microfocus is a COBOL company. They're doing really well. They have, they have a 20th century object COBOL. Um, they have lots of enterprise customers for their tool suite. They're doing really well. So um, uh, one of the lessons about technologies is that they never go away once you've started using them. This is why you should be very careful with Perl 6. Because it's never, you know, once people start using it, it's, you're never going to be able to change it again. And it's never going away. So I'm actually quite pleased that you're being cautious and that you're kind of sneaking up on it and hoping it doesn't notice you behind it. Um, so now, what, so what, what, what do people think about this, the, these linguistic definitions? You know, am I, am, am I uh, treading in dangerous territory here by suggesting you shouldn't use the word free? I've got a, a, a question back there. <laughs> All right. Um, so I totally c agree with linguistic frame. Because in Perl, we talk about linguistic frames and all that sort of stuff. Um, but at the beginning, when I came in, um, you're talking about uh, um, avoiding the free, as in money, mm -hmm. um, definition. But there's a large group of users of open source software that don't contribute back. Mm -hmm. And for them, price is part of, the, part of the deal. And so when we're talking about open source community, where do you put that very okay. large group of people for whom the contributing back is not really uh, imp of importance to them directly or in a way that they would acknowledge. Right. Well, uh, so they're not, I, I don't think that most of those people are willfully not contributing back. 
I think they're just in contexts where they're not improving the software. And uh, so, so this is why I, I actually don't think that the pr that price is actually the, the dominant factor there. Because I think that we, we're, we're all of us benefiting from not having to pay license fees for the software. But it's not the reason we're in open source. And uh, distinguishing, distinguishing between the benefit that we have and the, and the dynamic of the community is the key here. So, uh, in, uh, um, so I'm, I'm still involved in the Document Foundation that produces LibreOffice. Um, and uh, we could talk about that if you like, because I've spent a lot of time doing LibreOffice and, and OpenOffice. Um, and there are a lot of people who don't contribute to LibreOffice. Uh, LibreOffice had uh, nearly 100 million downloads since 2011. And we have definitely not got 100 million people contributing to the software in any way. We actually do have a scary number of people who are contributing money. And one of the most entertaining problems we've had at the Document Foundation is working out what you do with a million euros when it gets donated to you by individuals. Uh, you may not think that's a problem, but it's a huge problem to a, a, a true open source community to suddenly get a lot of money. Because what do you do with it? I mean, you can't pay developers because that destroys your community. Because everyone is there because they've got an extrinsic motivation. And as soon as you start paying a developer, you, the people start to have intrinsic motivations and it destroys the community. So what do you do with all that money? And so we've been coming up with creative things to do with that, and I can talk to you some more about that. But um, I, I, I think that those people are simply using the software. They're exercising their liberty to use the software. And uh, we don't ask questions about how or why they're doing it. And their use of the software isn't resulting in improvements coming out of the software on their behalf. And we don't mind, because lots of people use software without improving it. And uh, if any of them became significant users of the software, and had the resources to get somebody to fix a problem they have, it would be in their interests to contribute it back to the community. So I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't treat those people as freeloaders. Those people are users. And just like Pearl, you know, I have never contributed anything to the Pearl community, and yet I benefit from massive amounts of Pearl code. And honestly, the reason I'm using the Pearl code is because it's Pearl code, and it does things that I want it to do. It's not because it's of the price. So I, 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 I think that you know, it's easy to focus in on the price and assume that's the reason everyone's using LibreOffice. Um, the closest I will get to that is that people use LibreOffice um, because they would much rather use Microsoft Office, but they can't afford it. And uh, they, so they have a poverty motive for using LibreOffice. But I, I, I think that if we focus on the, on the license cost, we lose sight of the fact that actually we're moving into a, an economy that goes beyond money. So we were having this conversation last night about the change in the structure of society. The industrial society is a, a hierarchical society of control points where the value in a control point is traded for money. So I have control over the means of distribution or the means of production and uh, you give me money and I give you access to my means of production to have one of my things. Or I give you access to my, my means of, of uh, transport and I, I send, you, send your thing to somebody else. And we're moving out of that world. We're moving into a peer-to-peer -peer world. And in a peer-to-peer -peer world, the value that people exchange can go beyond money. So the value that people can exchange can be time. It can be attention. It can be information about themselves, information about their knowledge. All of those things turn out to have value. And we're all kind of a bit scared of this because Facebook seems to be making a lot of money out of information about us. And actually, it isn't the most important thing for them. It's better actually to look at Twitter. Twitter isn't making a profit. Um, and uh, people look at Twitter and they say, well, why isn't Twitter making a profit? Well, Twitter is busy trading something else. Twitter is gaining influence. It is, it is gaining structural power in society. Because that was its goal, I think. Uh, I've never heard Ev say that explicitly, but that's what, I th that's what I think is really going on. So we're in a society where you trade different things. And I think the problem with thinking about price, about it being free, free as in free software that you don't have to pay for, is people trade more than that these days. And uh, you lose, if you focus on the money the whole time, you lose track of the other things people trade, their time, their attention, their identity, their compassion their presence, 
their family, their community, are all things that people now exchange in order to create richness in their lives. Question down there. Yeah, uh, you touched in on an important problem, I think, in uh, how we think about open source and how it's developed. And uh, that's about paying for the development of open source. And, uh, well, in the Perl community and in some other communities, you do have sponsors who pay for uh, grants or other things. They pay for projects uh, or they pay for um, a kind of support that goes to con continued life cycle of yep. software beyond its normal life cycle. Uh, what you'd call it the uh, <laughs> lifeline, sort of. Yep. Uh, and that is a problem to us because we're used to thinking it, of it as a pure community uh, effort. Yep. But how big a problem is it really that some companies and some people prefer to pay money instead of uh, directly contributing with their own right. time or their own employees' time that is indirectly paying. So we've had this conversation a lot in the Document Foundation and um, we actually do think that it's, we would much rather people contributed uh, something other than money. Um, so I was just saying how uh, in the mesh society, in the peer-to-peer -peer mesh society, there's much more that we can trade now than just money. And we would much rather people broke out of this fixation with money and started trading other things, trading, trading skills and presence and, 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 and uh, uh, access to community and so on. Um, now, having said that, w on LibreOffice, there are some things that need doing. Uh, we've got a scary set of build servers because we're building something which is absolutely enormous. Uh, I mean, and you're, uh, in Perl, you're building something enormous as well. And you know that building something of that size is, is just hugely complex, takes a very long time, is very fragile. And the people who make it s still keep on building aren't doing the most glamorous job in the world. And so we pay people to do that. And that's a good thing we do with the money. Something else we've discovered is that nobody wanted to start LibreOffice for Android because... Um, LibreOffice for Android is not at all sexy. In the, the first thing is not at all sexy. So you, when you're building LibreOffice for Android, you're, you build something that just doesn't work. That's your first step. You build something that just does nothing useful. The first implementation of LibreOffice for Android was a flashing cursor on a phone. And the guys who wrote it were absolutely ecstatic that they had managed to get a flashing cursor on a phone. Because this, this, this had taken them like a year of development to make get a flashing cursor on a phone. And no one wants to do that. Now, we figure that once it exists, people will want to work on it. So what we've done is we've taken some of this money that gets donated to the Document Foundation, and we have created a tender, which we have published, for public bids to build LibreOffice for Android. And then two or three companies have bid to us to build LibreOffice for Android. And one of them, Calabra, has, has taken that. And there's, there's actually two companies that, that, that have won it. Egalia is another one, I think. And they've taken, uh, they've taken our contract and they have agreed to deliver the first stage of LibreOffice for Android by a given date. And we believe that by doing that, we are actually acting on behalf of our community. That we are giving the community the ability to reach a point where their personal interests, their, their extrinsic in interests, are uh, sufficient to be able to take over the work. Um, we will do one or maybe two rounds of tenders around that software. And we're doing the same with, with the web version of LibreOffice as well. Uh, actually, in that case, we found a company that wants to use it for uh, a production activity. I can't actually read that, Salvi. Five. Five, OK. I've got to shut up in five minutes. Um. One comment yes. on the uh, use of language. Yes. Uh, you repeatedly mentioned LibreOffice. Yes. Uh, but you haven't uh, encouraged the use of Libre instead of open or free or gratis. And uh, English is a fascinating, flexible language in that we can change and adapt it in how we use it right. by making precedents. And LibreOffice is one of them. There's a few conferences and uh, organizations like Libre Planet and the Libre Graphics Meeting, which is also encouraging the use of Libre. It might confuse some people. They might ask, add, ask additional questions. Yeah. But then you make it clear that you're not meaning the gratis version of free. 
So, uh, I, and I, I very much like that usage. So I, I was a fan of, when we called LibreOffice, LibreOffice. I was a fan of, doing, of calling it that for that reason. The difficulty is, is actually America. Who, they don't, first of all, they don't know how to say Libra. There's a large Spanish-speaking populace in this country. Yes. The country but, of US. But nonetheless, um, uh, uh, we've found that, so the, the LibreOffice has a very weak presence in, in North America. Um, we suspect one of the reasons is because they can't decide whether it's Libre, Libri, Libra. They think it's maybe to do with astrology. Um, and and, and the, the, word, the word is a distraction for the sort of people who download OpenOffice. And um, it, I actually think it is something of an obstacle for LibreOffice in North America because of that. Mm -hmm. And, and <laughs> particularly in Texas. Uh, so uh, th 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 there is a beautiful anecdote about a, a girl who wanted to translate her state motto into Latin and was shouted down for uh, wanting to, w wanting to, uh, uh, to u w use what people thought was Spanish because they associated the word Latin with Latin America and didn't understand that the state motto in Latin wasn't pref preferring Spanish over English. So, so, so I, I like the word, and it works great in Europe because most people in Europe who are using English are using it as a second language, and it is an extremely positive term in Europe. Most people who are using uh, English in North America are using it as a first language and also don't have the uh, international uh, experience to know that the word is not negative. So uh, that's the un an unfortunate consequence. I've got a question and yes. you're closing. Uh, thankfully, we don't have this problem in Norwegian because, yep. uh, and you know this, and, uh, because free is actually never gratis in Norwegian. But I have a question uh, because you mentioned that, uh, and I, I really appreciate these linguistic uh, um, discussion because names are really important. And I know a whole bunch of different software that is really useful and really good, but never gets used because the name is so strange. Mm -hmm. um, it's true, that, that's what, that happens. Uh, I I, I've written some software like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I have a question for you, and that is because you mentioned that uh, you had this problem where, and you've, I'm sure you've thought about it, like what to do with a million euros in a, an open source community. And um, I, I come from a talk yesterday for, f with Paul Henning Kamp, uh, open BSD guy, uh, who, uh, who had uh, an argument for spending money on code reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, something that you guys have thought about? So, w w uh, again, in LibreOffice, we, we're spending money on a variety of things, and that is the sort of thing we would spend money on. What we typically do, do is we, we leave time for community engagement. And if something is really important and no one in the community engages, we then work out, try to work out whether we can uh, cover someone's costs in some way. Can we, can we fly them somewhere? Can we, uh, should we pay for a hackathon in, uh, and we, you know, we have lots of hack fests in Germany because we've got a lot, of, a lot of community members there. When that all fails, when that doesn't deliver the thing we want to do, then the next thing we do is we write a tender and we uh, uh, try and get as many community members as possible to tender for the activity. And um, I, I think code reviews would fall into one of those, la those latter two categories. Now, for LibreOffice, code reviews are less relevant. I, I, I kind of disagree with you on that uh, <laughs> point because of the enormous user base and the really, really big uh, rea uh, reality that there is a whole bunch of bugs in any software. Right. Roughly a thousand, uh, like one bug per thousand lines of code. So, so um, what we did, we, we did autom automated code reviews. So um, what's the name of that code coverage tool? Um, code coverage is, uh, co coverity is really good. Coverity. But, but uh, uh, coming from a security standpoint, yep. I'm sure I'm a little bit biased. Uh, I'm just asking whether, because of the big user, user base, and because of the very low incentive, in extrinsic incentive to do code reviews in an open source environment, it would, yeah. be, it would make sense to so, spend So I, I do think it makes sense to do, and uh, I think it's likely that we will do more of those. Uh, the, the first step was to run co do, do coverity scans, 
Um, we've got our coverity score down to roughly zero now. So coverity is no longer finding is no longer finding things. And that means that the guys who've got an interest in this area are going to have to start asking to do new things. And I think the next thing they, they, they will want to do will be code reviews. The other difficulty with OpenOffice, of course, is, that, uh, is deciding where you start with a code review because it's a lake of... Uh, it's actually a, a, a cauldron of tangled spaghetti. <laughs> and trying to decide where you're going to do a code review is fundamentally difficult. But I, I think that having, having now used Coverity to, to run the very last co um, automated de detected bug to the ground, I think that they're going to have to start thinking about code reviews, yes. I, I actually think the guys who do that are sufficiently motivated that we might not need to use money at all. Um, because the, the people who did... We didn't pay anyone to do Coverity scans. They, they just wanted to use the tool. Um, but uh, maybe for code reviews we'll have to do that. But at the moment we're focused on... We think that for uh, LibreOffice to have a future, we need to have web and mobile versions of it. And so at the moment we're investing in making those... in creating the seed around which community can coalesce to make those come into existence. And that's been the priority for the last uh, nine months or so. I uh, do keep donating to LibreOffice, by the way. Uh, if anyone's got an open source project, we have a hint for how you get donations. I don't know if anyone's interested. Um, uh, everyone wants to donate to your project because they love you. But they just never get around to it because they're busy. They, when they come to your website, they've never come to donate money. They've always come to download something or to look for a, the answer to a problem. So the place you should ask them for money is after they have found what they were looking for. Uh, at the after they have done a search, put your request for money on the search results page. After they have done a download, while the download is taking place, put your request for money on the download page. And you'll discover that magically people start donating money to your project. Eclipse did it and uh, had lots of money. come. This is where we actually first got the idea was from the Eclipse Foundation who discovered that if they put their donation page on the download page for Eclipse, they got uh, nearly six times as, much, as many donations. And it's because people don't come, they want to donate, but that wasn't why they came to your website. So you need to put your request in a place where they finished what they came to do and then exploit their goodwill. If they don't feel any goodwill towards you, that won't actually help any because they have actually got to want to donate. But if you move the donation to, where, to, to just after they've finished what they came to do, they will donate to you. I've run out of time. I think. Yeah, um, we're four minutes over. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It's okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, since you're here and we can go, f uh, do, do we have uh, room for two more um, uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two fast ones. First, uh, Hakim in the front, and then we had a hand okay. over here. Uh, but I, I, make I, it quick. I had I was actually more of a comment on your um, idea of framing. Right. I, I, I always assumed that the reason I don't use so much proprietary software is because of cost. But actually, it's because in order to evaluate whether I want to pay £100, £50, £5, I have to go through lots of hoops and sign a form, and then I have to fill in a, a temporary license, then I've got a, a, a limited time period. And all of that actually mitigates against me discovering whether I want to pay the money at right. all. So I think the permission frame is actually very useful for that. Yep. So thank you for that. It's, it's a pleasure. I, I, uh, I'm most, when I'm talking about open source with lawyers, I most commonly talk about permission because uh, I, I try and help them to understand. So if ever you're talking with lawyers about open source, um, you've got to understand that they don't un they, they, they're not there to do what we're there to do with a license. They're used to licenses being bilateral. They're, they're, it's, an, it's a truce between two warring factions. Uh, that's what a lot, all, almost all legal agreements that your corporate lawyer does are, are a truce between two warring factions. They dis define the land between the two, the, two, the two villages and they say where fighting is allowed and on what grounds. And that's not what an open source license is. An open source license is a multilateral agreement. It is the consensus of the community about how the four freedoms are going to be delivered. And lawyers never understand this. So talking to them about how an open source license is about giving permission in advance and explaining to them that it is the, a community consensus, not a bilateral agreement, uh, is the fast path to helping lawyers understand what they're doing for you when they c come and do something. If you haven't said that to them, they try and write a new open source license. And then OSI will humiliate them. Uh, 
question? Yeah, uh, hi. Thank you very much for this very enlightening uh, talk. I'm not at all a developer, but I really uh, liked the first thing you said about scale, human organization, and politics. Because what I feel is that, and I discovered that in the open source, is that it's changing the paradigm of our society. Mm -hmm. And I connect that very, very hugely to collaborative economy. We talk more and more about sharing economy, and you talked about peer to peer. But much more broadly, it's about how we shift from the competitive uh, society toward a collaborative society where the power is distributed. So when you were talking about politics and when you were talking about how to use that money that people give, this is crowdfunding because this is collaborative economy and it's, we are building commons, contributive production, and we're all sharing the use of what we're building. Yeah. So we are also in the collaborative consumption. But it's also about the collaborative governance that we build around those commons and that today we have no yet answers and, and also tuning the good exchange tools because money is one way to balance contribution but there are other ways to do yes. that and choosing the good exchange tools. So uh, I, I actually think that the, the next big problem for open source leaders is community governance um, because uh, th there is no benchmark for good community governance. I've, tri I've now twice tried to work out a benchmark for working out if a community is a good community. And uh, my first attempt at that was called the Open by Rule Benchmark, which you'll find on my website. And uh, the Apache Software Foundation scores a perfect 10 on that benchmark. And yet the Apache Software Foundation has been horribly gamed in several projects. Uh, Apache Harmony, for example, which is the Java project over which Google are now being sued by, uh, by Oracle. Um, that, that project was a corporate game by some extremely clever people who understood how Apache's dynamics worked and managed to install and create and then play a community game uh, around Apache Harmony. And um, so I've, I'm, I'm now rethinking how you evaluate the quality of community governance because I, I don't think it's at all obvious what the value of community governance is going to be. I think probably good governance prevents the participants in the community exploiting each other. I think that is probably the benchmark of good, good governance. Now, how you measure that, I'm, I'm still asking questions about. Fortunately, there are, there are clever people who are asking questions about that as well. People like Carlo Dafara uh, and um, uh, Bjorn, what's his, what's the, I forgot what Bjorn's name, his surname is. Um, uh, there, there, are, there are academic researchers who are looking into governance and, and how it works. And um, I'm looking forward to being able to tell their stories at future talks. I think uh, this is a good time to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.